Hello, Lewis. Hi, Glenn. Welcome to The Glenn Show, uh, Lewis. Um, I'm Glenn Lowry of uh, Brown University and Blogging Heads. Uh, please introduce yourself, Lewis. Well, Glenn, I'm actually your colleague at Brown University, uh, Lewis Putterman, and I teach economics. Um, what else should I tell you about myself? I, I've been a specialist in economic systems for a long time and used to um, do a lot of work on the developing world and how firms are organized. And, right. And lately I am a, an experimental economist, do behavioral, experimental, social decision studies. Okay, so we're going to talk about all of that. Lewis Putterman, my colleague uh, here at Brown University's economics department, so we got a kind of uh, inside conversation today. Uh, and Lewis Putterman, whom I've known and admired for a long time as a student of uh, economic systems, economic organization, uh, firms uh, working, in, as you say, in the developing world uh, with a, a long background in China and kind of study of the comparative ways of organizing economic activity and with these amazing changes that have happened uh, in China right. since the time of Mao. But yeah, I take responsibility for all of the, the economic growth in China. Oh, you're going to take credit yeah. for that. <laughs> Uh, but we are here as well, uh, not only to draw on your uh, considerable expertise, Lewis, over a long career in the study of economic organization, economic systems, but also to discuss your book, which I'm holding up for the benefit of the camera right now, The Good, the Bad, and the Economy. And I wonder if we couldn't just uh, get you to uh, tell us a word or two about the book, and then uh, we can sort of take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk about it. So. Uh, this is an attempt to write for a general audience. It's not a really academic ebook. Um, yeah. Because I feel that the issues I've been working on for 30 years or so uh, really have something to do with the real world, in addition to being able to get publications in the academic journals. So um, the book addresses uh, two very broad issues, and I think we're going to talk mostly about the first one. So it, it deals with the question that uh, is in the book's subtitle, Does Human Nature Rule Out a Better World? Which, another way of paraphrasing that would be, you know, is it true what uh, some economists and uh, some uh, defenders of a free market system might tell us that we really can't have uh, uh, a, a better social and economic structure than what we've had the last 30, 40 years because of human nature, because people are fundamentally self-interested and uh, we just have to construct our institutions on the basis of that self-interest. So that's the Okay, first, just that's to, the, to clarify, yeah. this is on the presumption that a better world means a world with less inequality or a world with less poverty or a world with a greater degree of social right. cooperation good, good than question. the world we live in. Right, it's, and, and, and I try to be somewhat broader than that because I think that the critique that the market economy with its um, consumerism and materialism is is also kind of pointing us in bad directions uh, spiritually in terms of our social relationships and the whole environmental question. All of these are, are very important concerns. And so the issue is, you know, are we, are we driven by our nature to have this kind of consumerist market economy that kind of maybe lowers life quality all around as well as inducing all the inequalities that you mentioned? Okay, so that's at least one of the central questions uh, in the book, the relationship between human nature and, right. and the uh, social yeah, organization. Yeah, if I, I just mention briefly the, the other thing is it does have a, a large section dealing with well, what explains the vast global inequalities that we have, you know, why there are two billion or, or more very poor people Indeed. and so forth. And uh, I think I have a a fairly original view of that, and it's engaging in debate with people like uh, uh, Asimoglu and Robinson's recent book, and and uh, the work of Jeff Sachs and others. So that's 
that may be a topic for for another day but that's also okay well let's then let's then stick with the first Thank one you. first of all let me back up for a minute because um uh you said you want to take credit for everything that's happened in China. Right. Uh, and why not? Let's give uh, Lewis Putterman credit, okay? okay uh, that in uh, two dollars and fifty cents will get you a latte at Starbucks. But 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 um, the question of you know uh, what are people like in our nature, and how does that relate to selfishness or motivation or you know, in other words, the, so the libertarian or the kind of free market ideologue might say, you know, you're never going to get the farmer to actually produce unless you allow him to keep the profit from his... If you tell him to work for the good of the people, I mean, it, you know, that just won't work. And uh, presumably that's a claim about human nature. People can't be effectively motivated in large numbers to do anything uh, really difficult or to, you know, find out the most efficient way of proceeding or to overcome whatever the obstacles or problems are unless they're going to be allowed to keep some profit at the end. Uh, and does the, here's my question, I don't mean to go on, Chinese experience, uh, a Maoist uh, you know, history, a ideology of Marxist, uh, communist, uh, communal, uh, anti-market, uh, whatever, and yet the, the flourishing in the last uh, 30 years or whatever of uh, this uh, you know, dynamic, uh, very obviously capitalist uh, uh, outcropping of economic uh, growth, I mean, does, it, does it now finally prove once and for all and beyond any argument, I'm asking you, uh, about the, um, uh, you know, so there's really only one path in the forest here if we want to mobilize millions of people in uh, cooperative endeavor, and that's uh, to allow them to keep what they do, to give them the incentives associated with markets and, and profit and, and private gain. Uh, to to uh, instantiate institutions of property and uh, allow people to build, you know, their, their sort of structure of their lives and their aspirations around that, and so on. Um, there's certainly a lot of truth in everything that you've said. Um, it's mostly nuance that we could talk about for a long time. But I, I think I think the Chinese experience is extremely uh, instructive, and and you're absolutely right that. Uh, it does provide a lot of evidence that people respond better when uh, they can benefit themselves and their families by by their economic actions. And there's just no question. I was a I was focusing especially on agriculture in China uh, in my early work, and I studied a lot about the collective farming system. Um, under that system, the farmers had to share. The, uh, the value of the output that they produced. Uh, there was a little bit of differentiation according to what work each individual did, but it was relatively small. Um, and there's no disputing the fact that when they went to dividing the fields up so that each family had its own plot of land, uh, some varying in, from place to place between 1979 and roughly 1983, um, the output shot up. And it's also the case that the outputs were constrained by the fact that the government uh, controlled the whole crop marketing system and tried to pay the farmers as low a price as they could get away with because that was a way of uh, sort of funding industrialization to be able to keep the urban wages cheap. Yeah. And uh, when the government decontrolled the prices, uh, that did have a tremendous role in, in boosting agriculture. So there's a there's an awful lot without, of without impairing the ongoing process of industrialization. Yep. So there's, I mean, there's a lot to learn there, but by the same token, I, I uh, strongly disagree with characterizations of, of China's achievements under the, uh, the attempt to build socialism. I'm much more on the side of people like Amartya Sen, who would uh, emphasize that China had some pretty uh, uh, extraordinary achievements in terms of e increasing life expectancy, building basic literacy and education. And in yes. fact, uh, you know, one of the big ironies of China is that many of the investments that the Maoist policies made in the population uh, paid off in a dramatic way during the reform period. Okay, uh, just to emphasize, you're saying that even prior to China's miraculous uh, uh, economic uh, growth of the last three decades, 
very substantial achievements in advancing well-being amongst the uh, many Chinese people had been made under Maoist communism. Right. So there, 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 there is a caricature that China was stagnant or declining all the way up to 1979, and and even the World Bank uh, disputes that very strongly. Um, Comparisons of China with other developing countries such as India show that actually industry was growing much more rapidly in China um, and uh, uh, you know, output in general was growing more rapidly. China had an indigenous green revolution, but China at the same time did much better in terms of human development indicators of boosting literacy and, and uh, uh, health care. Uh, life expectancy during that period. So a lot of what's happened since 1979 in China has, has built on those foundations, but has definitely demonstrated that people respond to material incentives. Yep. Okay. okay, let's go back to the argument of the book. I mean, can I just ask you, you say human nature, and does that preclude us from having a better world? But what is you know, uh, if Sam is skeptic, say I'm doubtful about uh, the claims that uh, there's something intrinsic in the way human beings are or have evolved to be in our nature that uh, has strong implications for social organization. Uh, what, what, what would be the evidence and the argument that you point to to persuade me that no, 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 human nature is quite relevant for a social, political, moral, uh, discourse about about collective life. Well, first of all, uh, I hope I'm not evading your question too much by by just starting with the uh, <clears throat> comparison of uh, the economic man that we often teach about in economics courses, right? And uh, that a lot of, of traditional economic theory is based on, where the individual is only interested in in that individual's. Uh, wealth or, or income results and in avoiding effort, right? And, and pursues that yeah. in an in a, uh, unlimitedly uh, rational fashion. Um, it's that kind of depiction of, of human nature or what, what, what a person is that I'm, I'm trying to compare with a more naturalistic and, and uh, evolutionarily based uh, picture of humans. Humans are social animals. Um, humans are, are, are moral creatures. Um, so some of the specific evidence has to do with the importance of families, the importance of, of kin ties and altruism within the family. Uh, reciprocity is a very strong element in, in people's interactions. Uh, and of course, the, the book emphasizes work in experimental uh, decision making, experimental economics, because that's a field that I've been active in for the last dozen years or more <clears throat> that I believe uh, provides a lot of evidence about how human, human social nature uh, uh, differs from, from what we would expect based on the rational um, self-interested model. Well, you know, everybody except people with PhDs in economics would have already been inclined to, to believe that people were not motivated merely by a kind of maniacal, one-dimensional, self-interested, pecuniary, materialistic, acquisitive uh, uh, dimension. Exactly. Uh, they would have yeah. thought, they would have thought introspectively or just looking around themselves that obviously human motivation is much more complex, social, and so on than that. So it's kind of an inside baseball <laughs> thing to have discovered. Exactly. Isn't it? <laughs> when you when you when you try to explain this stuff to your friends or your family members, you first have to back up and convince them that economists take seriously that there's a question. You know, and and you, you say you know we're we're basically trying to prove in a more scientific and rigorous and controlled fashion. What you already know to be true, but we've convinced ourselves and our students is not true. But you know, I've always thought about this, Lewis, having you know been a student of economics since well, I don't know, 1970. <laughs> I've always thought about this that 
there is this beautiful edifice of equilibrium theory and the, the you know, the Arrow de Brewer model and the, 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 the welfare theorems and all of this, that, again, it's inside baseball, but basically what it is is demonstrating with mathematical precision, precision the exact conditions under which markets, competition, and self-interest lead to social efficiency, you know, sort of the, the uh, scientific instantiation of Adam Smith's invisible hand kind of conjecture. I've always thought of that that, um, well, yes, and there's an idealism in that, you know, and there are all the assumptions that one has to make that we, you and I are so very well familiar with about information and about markets and all this, but that, uh, that there was a kind of, you know, I never took it seriously as a description of social organization. I took it as an idealized uh, uh, demonstration of the, you know, sort of efficiency promoting principles of, you know, of market, property, private pursuit. I never, it, in other words, it always to me had more of a kind of normative than it did a positive uh, uh, rationale and, and life sure. to it. Uh, and, and so it was, you know, I mean, it seems to me that you can make one kind of mistake, which is to fetishize those the assumptions of that of that grand edifice of equilibrium theory and economics, and think of it as you know the only way of thinking about human beings. But you can also make another kind of mistake, which is to observe in the fact that human beings are much more complicated than the actors assumed in that idealized structure. That the lessons that come out of that idealization have no bearing on actual human sure. institutions. No, and I, I I totally agree with that, <laughs> and and I uh, am working very hard to avoid, you know, going in the, to the opposite extreme. So uh, yeah. if you open up my book, you, you, you notice there's a, a sort of a dedication that says, uh, it says, to those who have been now, I take it. a copy, I don't know where it now, is. Now, don't let me something like, yeah, for those, those who seek a better world and are not satisfied with easy answers, so uh -huh. by easy answers, I mean both, you know, the easy answer that we're all selfish and we just have to use this rational choice theory to explain everything, but also the opposite extreme that, you know, we're all social animals with lots of sentiment and, and you know, concern for each other. I mean, so a lot of the, the, uh, the, the selfish rational actor model uh, has has validity and casts light on a lot of what what goes on. And use the Chinese example that we just did. That's a perfect example. But I can tell you from from my from my own um, career, uh, the first 15 years or so that I was working on things like um, collective agriculture and economic planning and workplace democracy, I had decided I'm going to be an economist. Right. That was my field. That's I got hired in the economics department and had a PhD in that field. So yeah. I felt straitjacketed that everything I did had to be based on the rational actor, the selfish rational actor approach, because anything else would be laughed out of court as, you know, this is this is you're making special assumptions, you're smuggling something right. into the utility function, or you could do that. Very ad hoc. That's the right. kiss of death, right? The word right. ad hoc. Right. Oh, I mean, there there were always some journals where you could publish this stuff, but I wanted to, you know, get in get in what we call the good journals, and that's right. it had to be the rational, selfish actor model. And it was only sometime around the mid '90s that I I noticed that a few people were succeeding in broadening that. There was this movement yeah. toward a behavioral approach. And yeah. using the experimental lab was one of the keys to it, because we just got real people in. They made decisions. We started testing theoretical models, and you know we could use all of our econometrics and 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 uh, uh, technical tools to analyze it. And then it was no longer a soft core sort of semi sociological behaviorism, but it was real economics that was allowed. So let, let me uh, just amplify a bit what you're saying here, because I think it's very important that there's been a change uh, in academic economics in the last right. 20 years. Uh, there's a revolution, yep. really, 
Uh, people like Vernon Smith uh, would be one, a Nobel laureate, uh, experimental economist, but there are many others. Uh, Ernst Fair would be another, but I, we want to put Louis Putterman's name on that list, and many, many others who have uh, begun to study a lot of these questions in economics about how markets work or what's the nature of human cooperation and motivation in idealized settings where they can get uh, you know students or other subjects to uh, sit in a laboratory at computer screens and engage in interactions for uh, relatively small but real uh, uh, benefit and cost uh, to see see what happens, see what will happen under this or that condition. And uh, this has now opened up uh, to uh, you know, major research programs uh, at uh, many universities uh, and uh, you know, centers of uh, research around the world uh, for people to begin an inquiry that's now being reflected in the journals. People are getting tenure on the basis of these articles. Books are being written. A whole discipline has been created. Uh, and you've been a part of that movement, and its uh, fruit is reflected to some degree in your Yeah, book. exactly. And, um, we, we could mention uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who won a Nobel Prize recently. Oh, yes, we must. She passed away just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. She was a, a leader mm -hmm. in, in that movement. But exactly, there's a lot going on, and I'd just like to say that uh, I think the public has become aware of behavioral economics through the work of people like Dan Ariely, um, yep. or uh, Sunstein and uh, Thaler, but most of the behavioral economics that the public learns about is not about the social interaction side. It's not about what people like Ernst Fair and, uh, and Ostrom and, and Vernon Smith, maybe uh, Colin Kammer and myself, you know, call social preferences. These things like reciprocity. And you know that's what I I I, I uh, am am addressing in the book. The fact and the reciprocity is not just this nice thing, of you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, and we can all successfully cooperate. It also has this negative side, which is very fruitful, of if I scratch your back but you don't scratch mine, you know, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna get back at you. People people have yeah. people have this inbuilt. Uh, capacity for for anger, I, I think it is, uh, you know, in the simple term, at, at those who exploit yeah, but, their own cooperativeness. And there's always a game going on of everyone uh, seeing whether they can work out a degree of cooperation, but each person has an incentive to shade on that a little bit to get a better deal for themselves. Let me just interrupt a little bit, Lewis, here to, to emphasize two things that you've just said. One is this distinction between the behavioral economics of kind of the the individual. You say Ariely, you right. mentioned Dan Ariely, you mentioned uh, Cass Sunstein and um, and Richard Thaler, and uh, you know the observation that there are there are uh, built into the human psychology deviations in the way that individuals behave from what a sort of straightforward, self-interested, rational actor might predict. But that is kind of limited to individuals' uh, psychological uh, 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 affinities and doesn't engage this question of what are implications, behavioral implications for institutions, social cooperation, social interactions that yeah, distinguish exactly. the individual from the social. And that's important. But the other thing is this idea that once you start talking about the social, and about the issues of cooperation, which is like this fundamental question when we talk about self-interest, right? Because how is it then that we we get past the you know the prisoner's dilemma problem of that we'd all be better off if we cooperated, but it's not in any of our individual interest to right. do so, given that whatever else others are doing. In fact, Eleanor Ashton and others observe we do manage to solve these collective action problems in various settings, and experimental uh, investigation of the social mm -hmm. behavioral. Uh, field is finding, um, uh, you know, insight and understanding as to how it exactly. is that it comes about. So, and this reciprocity thing is really important because it's not rational at the second round to punish the guy who didn't behave in the first round in the cooperative way. You know, the, the typical arguments about uh, the prisoner's dilemma would suggest that, you know, you're not going to get cooperation even if you think about punishment because it's not rational to carry out the punishment. And yet the behavioral findings are that indeed people uh, do, despite the fact that it might not be in their self-interest, uh, exact revenge yep. or exact 
imposing costs on others, even though it's costing to themselves to do when they feel that they haven't been fairly treated. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I see that as pretty central to this whole revolution, and, and that's one of the reasons why Aaron Spare made a big name, and I was sort of following in some of his uh, uh, innovations there, because it's, it's just so striking that people will, you know, incur a cost, to, uh, to punish someone who behaves unfairly, even though they should be letting bygones be bygones according to the rational uh, model. Uh, but I think based on, on a vast number of experiments, as well as, I think, you know, normal introspection, uh, everybody feels that if, if I'm following the rule because I've I've agreed to adjust my behavior a little bit so that the society or the group will be able to function successfully. And somebody else uh, cheats on the rule in an opportunistic, selfish way. I'm mad. I get mad. And that changes my behavior. <laughs> so so the, the kinds of uh, equilibria that we observe in social settings are not the ones, the, the, uh, only the ones that could be supported according to a model of rational actors. Uh, and and the yeah. evolutionary literature on this is basically about you know how we evolved to be more successful social creatures than rational individualists could be, and essentially you know you look at the you look at the environments in which human beings evolve, you look at the the nature of humans that we need families were born very helpless and all that sort of thing people had to had to. Uh, act as hunter-gatherers in, in groups, and uh, it's implausible that perfectly selfish actors could even have evolved. They would have been selected out, you know, by environmental constraints. Uh, so, you know, what what we are is 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 uh, is what we intuitively see. And in fact, the subjects who come into the lab, we can we can see by their by their behaviors before they've even seen their counterparts make their decisions that they are acting on the basis of this realistic model of human nature, not on the basis of our you know hypothetical uh, rational selfish model. So tell me, uh, Lewis, what uh, just in brief, if you will, what are some of the findings you observed in your um, experimental laboratory research that bear on this question of um, uh, is it uh, possible that we could have a better world? Well, uh, one example would be a set of experiments I've done over the past few years uh, with uh, a large number of different collaborators where we were studying a uh, social dilemma. Social dilemma is any situation, uh, people are, uh, tend to be familiar with the prisoner's dilemma, a situation in which uh, what's in the collective interest of a group of individuals is in conflict with uh, the maximum potential gain of any one individual. Well, yeah. so we're studying a social dilemma that involves engaging in production or engaging in stealing other people's property. Uh, and okay. uh, there's also the possibility of engaging in protecting your property from being stolen. This is a dilemma because uh, if production activity begins to have a declining uh, benefit on the margin, in other words, your first hour of work produces a lot, but your second a little bit less, and so on and so forth. Yep. Uh, on the margin, it might be rational for you to spend a, a, a finite amount of time in production and then spend some time stealing other people's stuff. And if everybody's doing right. that, it also might become profitable to spend some time guarding your existing property. Exactly. And so yeah. you end up in an equilibrium where people are doing a lot less producing than they could have been because they're doing a lot of stealing and guarding. Person. And everybody's losing because there's less stuff getting produced, right? So we conducted these experiments with student subjects in five different countries. Uh, one was a Brown, so mostly U.S., but we have a lot of international students, too. Uh, one was in Innsbruck, Austria. One was in Mexico City. One was in Seoul, Korea. And one was in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. We happened to choose the countries to be diverse, but we also had, um, you know, contacts, students, whatever, who were able to carry out yep. the uh, research in those particular countries. 
And we found tremendous differences in the behaviors across country. And the most dramatic was in a treatment where the subjects were permitted to send some text messages to each other before they made their actual binding decisions about how much to steal and how much to produce. Uh, we found the subjects yeah. in countries that we think of as having very strong institutions and social norms, especially Austria, but also to some degree the United States, um, and um, to only slightly lesser degree, um, uh, I think, uh, South Korea, um, the Mexican subjects were also somewhere in, in between. Uh, these, these subjects were able to reach agreements that they kept, that they would just engage in production, they didn't steal from each other. Uh, even in the treatments where there was no communication allowed, the subjects in Austria and the United States, uh, about 30 percent of them initially engaged in no theft, whereas the equilibrium prediction was that they would spend 70% of their tokens on theft. But in the, the societies where the wow. social institutions were weaker, there was a lot more theft, and the uh, ability to communicate was not able to lead to that much improvement, especially in the among the Mongolian subject pool. I don't want to defame the country, but that was the way that it, it worked out. And there's a country that, you know, had uh, 50 years under communism, and before that was basically a nomadic society. So maybe as a different institutional background coming into the present. So, so uh, let, let me just ask you a question about this. It's fascinating, all right? So we've got this variation across countries and the extent to which these uh, subjects of a laboratory experiment can uh, or do realize uh, the potential of productivity by ending up not uh, stealing from each other and having to protect themselves exactly. against being stolen from. And that seems to match up to some degree uh, with the quality or somehow reliability of the, of the institutions of governance uh, and uh, whatnot within those respective yeah. countries. And, and it's, it's not just the formal institutions of governance, but I would emphasize that things like the World Value Survey measure of trust, how much people trust other people. And, yeah. Okay. So now the question I have to ask is whether or not this is finding out anything about human nature in, this, in the observations that are being observed because a person might speculate that these uh, subjects in your laboratory having been drawn from society have acclimated themselves to ways of thinking, behaving, they have a set of expectations that is uh, shaped by the institutions in which, in, you know, the, in the culture in which they live. And if they have low trust in government, if, you know, promises aren't kept, if uh, I don't know what uh, violence is used as a way of s resolving disputes, if uh, people put clan loyalties ahead of national loyalties mm -hmm. or whatever, then they may, they may, even in the laboratory, sort of import these uh, acculturated uh, uh, habits of conduct uh, uh, in there and then reflect them in their, their behavior under your various conditions. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know if I'm saying anything at variance with what you guys actually conclude from the, from the enterprise, but it doesn't sound like human so nature I think, to me yeah, to I observe think this variation. the gene yeah. versus culture kind of question, and, and, and I appreciate, yeah. you know, the opportunity to, to make clear that I am I'm not at all arguing that all human behavior is hardwired in our genes. Rather, it's that we have genetic predispositions uh, toward absorbing social norms and moral, you know, messages. Um, it's, it's part of our, the machinery that we're born with. Exactly what messages we absorb depends on what's in our environment. And I would, I very much advocate the idea of a gene slash culture co-evolution as um, advocated by people like um, Rob Boyd and, and Peter Richardson, and uh, uh, even E.O. Wilson and, and various others have, have made this sort of argument. So we're not really talking about the human genome dictating all the details of what we are. Yeah. We're talking about genes and environment 
construct the person together. And the environment is very much a social environment. Now, this is a little bit off the, uh, the topic of your book, but it is related. I, I just happened to have spent some time in mm -hmm. South Korea recently. Uh, giving some lectures, and it was my first introduction to the society. A former student of mine is uh, now in a think tank over there, doing very well as a young uh, scholar. And, uh, I don't know if you knew Young Chul Kim uh, when he was a student here in our department, but he's he's doing well there now. But in any case, what I'm asking you about is a career yeah. school on every avenue. Uh, the incredible, hyper-competitive, educationally credential mm -hmm. rat race, what we economists would call it, which is a social interaction which leads people to overinvest in effort because their relative position is what's going to determine their prize and everybody's trying to get to the head of the line, but only one right. or a few people can be there. And that, it looks to me, is being played out in a society of 50 million people. I mean, it was unbelievable. I was told things that I just don't believe, like that families are spending 15% of their annual income on the tuition for cram schools mm -hmm. over and above the free public schools uh, that their children are staying up, getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning to begin their days and working until 10 o'clock at night uh, because there's a four-hour post-dinner cram session that they have to get in to get into these exams and stuff. And I, and, and, um, I, I guess that's by way of... Oh, did, did you notice the section? There's a little, <laughs> there are a couple of pages about that actually in my book. Yeah, the, 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 I found that... Uh -huh. I guess I betrayed that I didn't read every page. I thought that was a good example of self-interest. So, just for the for the general reader, before I you know before I talk about anything that sounds remotely academic, I have a a, a chapter just uh, telling stories that support the idea that yeah, people are pretty self-interested, and then another chapter telling stories. Well, yeah, you know, sometimes people actually care about others and they do altruistic things. So in the chapter about self-interest, I actually use this cram school business as one of the little vignettes. And there is a quotation from some United Nations body that, that judged that um, the uh, denial of play to Korean children by their mothers was you know, some sort of violation of the rights of the child. So yeah, I mean, yeah. there can be bad equilibrium like that. That's one of the the things that I'm talking about and exactly how how do you get beyond that? Um, it's very complicated. It's yeah. it's it's very complicated. I, I I guess my feeling is that that's far from the worst example of a bad equilibrium of self interested competition. There are far worse examples, you know, that have people committing uh, more serious crimes. But. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't have. I don't. I want to just say what, what to one or two of them are because maybe because you and I, Glenn, okay. at Brown University, you know, we benefit from getting all these hyper-educated students from Korea and, and and China and so forth. So I don't know if we want to end that that game. <laughs> well, actually, let's take the point a little bit further. Not only do you and I, uh, which is to say, as professors in a, um, you know. Uh, top-rate university where we get applicants from all over the world and so our student body will be enhanced by the quality of yeah. these uh, hyperactive, uh, uh, striving uh, Northeast Asian uh, uh, students. Not only that, American society as a whole, to the extent that our immigration can be selective and self-selective, and that we will, uh, in our universities, in our industry, in our think tanks, our laboratories, uh, be a place where people of great talent all over the world will want to come and make their fortunes and make their way uh, through a kind of brain drain, if you will, uh, dynamic, uh, will also benefit uh, from the... I mean, that's actually an interesting point, isn't it? That w w to some degree we could, as a society, the United States, afford a more laid-back, uh, you know, don't put too much pressure on the kids, let them explore their own you know, uh, notions of being and whatnot don't have the classroom be hyper kinetic uh, in terms of uh, focus on, you know, uh, uh, you know, just cramming all the human capital that you can get into the kid's head because uh, we can also draw on the human capital that's being produced in societies which are much less, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, yeah. Much, <laughs> much less tolerant right. of the, the soft side of, of the human development process. 
uh, you know, so we, we kind of uh, are, in, are, are indulgent in a way, in, in, a, in, in parasitic in a way on, uh, I don't know, maybe I take that too far. Yeah, but sure, it, sure. We're thinking about. Um, I got a couple of pushbacks, okay? One is on the experimental stuff, which I don't do it, but I, uh, you know, can't be alive in economics these days and not see what's happening, and I see a lot of these papers presented and, you know, read some of them. Uh, and it is about how I sometimes think that people want to draw conclusions about large social questions on the basis of what happens in their laboratories, and there are like mm -hmm. 20 different steps in between what happens in their laboratories and, and what we observe in the world, those steps involving things like politics, uh, things like the symbolic representation, the belief systems that are, you know, mm -hmm. able to, ideology, uh, things of this kind, so that, you know, uh, there, there's, I'm, I'm always kind of a little skeptical about, uh, about the claims that people want to make from laboratory experiments when they extend into the questions about social sure. institutions, because I don't see any politics, mm -hmm. I don't see any history, uh, things like that. And then the other pushback would just be like, okay, can we get a better world out of our study without, uh, and, and, you know, isn't, isn't getting a better world to a certain degree based mm -hmm. on persuading people about, about things? So can a guy like Marx, okay, I mean, I'm just mentioning him because here we are, I don't know, uh, Marx, uh, 1860, what is capital? We're 150 years past that, and uh, the, there's still a lot of echoes. Mm -hmm. This does a guy sitting in his study. Okay, so, so profound, social, critical, political, philosophic, moral, uh, religious, quasi religious, spiritual argumentation might create a better world just purely by turning the human mind in a different direction, quite apart from whatever the material substratum and the psychological constraints and whatnot might be. So, so those are two questions. One about the limits of experimental work in the laboratory to inform large questions of politics and social organization, and then the other about the potential of of the human imagination to create a better world quite independently of the uh, material well, constraints. The, the, the place I, did, I disagree with you on the second part is just where you use the, the phrase quite apart from. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you say wow. about the importance of the imagination and the importance of, of, of thinking through possibilities, but I don't think it's a quite apart from matter. I think that yeah. that's that's basically what, what my book and my research is all about. It's about saying, you know, we, when, when thinking about what we ought to do uh, to, to create something, you know, more in line with what we aspire towards, uh, we have to be realistic and as knowledgeable as possible about the material with which we're working. Um, so I'd say, I, you know, I think that we can we can achieve um, all kinds of things, perhaps um, that much that much more surely, that much more quickly, you know, that much more successfully, the more we understand the human material. Um, so that's and 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 the the constraint system there is obviously very complex because, as I said. We are created by both genes and environment slash culture, um, so we are constantly recreating ourselves by changing our culture. And you know, one of the themes that I talk about in the book is that there are some very important elements within our culture, aside from the elements promoted by, you know, the competitive marketplace. So there, there, are, there are values like equality of women, and uh, you know, uh, the struggle against racism and the importance of political rights and democracy and a lot of things have, have gained traction over the years that uh, uh, it's, this, this, is, this is potentially encouraging stuff that, that people can respond to, to these, uh, these ideals. Um, and. You know, I, I'm so glad that you mentioned this mm -hmm. last thing. You say equality of women, and you say anti-racism. And I'm thinking, well, let's take the case of equality of women. Um, I don't know if this has been spelled out in the scholarly literature, but it occurs to me that that value may well be uh, anti 
human mm -hmm. nature in some sense. That is, it's, it's like transcending the inclination or orientation that uh, has its root in our evolutionary, you know, sort of biogenetic uh, and uh, inherited cultural right. uh, baggage. But it's like, we're, you know, I'm thinking of, now I'm thinking of John mm -hmm. Stuart Mill, not Karl Marx. I'm thinking yeah. of that essay on the equality of women, that, you know, famous essay of Mill's. Uh, and I'm thinking just this argument, I mean, just the sheer right. force of a moral argument uh, about suffrage, about, you know, over and against what might be the physical differences between men and women that have been taken, uh, uh, led to some uh, unequal form in terms of social organization or the, you know, the, uh, the cultural uh, uh, traditions of uh, uh, the mm -hmm, division of mm -hmm. labor with respect to childbearing and child rearing and all of that that then may have congealed yeah. in one way or another into in egalitarian structures and it's like you know progressive human societies have transcended the inheritance of uh, the natural inheritance in order to elaborate uh, more egalitarian uh, practices uh, and understandings right. uh, around gender not yet of course uh, what they might become but still tremendously right. different right. from what they had once been uh, and uh, this is just a wonderful uh, illustration of the fact that we're not Determined <laughs> by our genes or, or our, uh, or our uh, you know, well, I would I would just put it differently and say that that we have within us those elements of of responding very strongly to uh, to to notions of fairness uh, and to to social norms to to wanting to be somebody that people can like and respect. To wanting to be somebody that you know to be able to respect ourselves, and if if the norms can be changed, emphasizing more the egalitarian side of our our intrinsic natures and de-emphasizing maybe some bias towards sexism, that some of which may be genetic. I don't know. Um, you know, we, we so we can kind of pick and choose which elements of our character we're going to try to to strengthen. And which we're going to try to to uh, to overcome uh, the the whole business right now with dealing with with um, with obesity is it's a, it's you know not not yeah. as much a social interaction issue but it's it's a, it's an issue of of how we deal with with our genetic nature and the more we learn about what what genetic inclinations you know are uh, interacting with our food system and our ability to process sugars and all that. Um, you know, the better off we are in terms of working out working out strategies. So we're not we're not all condemned to to obesity by our by our genetic uh, predispositions. But yeah, I hope that's true, Lewis, <laughs> because my life has been a struggle against obesity, and I'm losing. <laughs> Listen, I think uh, I reached the end of my available time at this moment. Uh, we should have another conversation uh, after a bit about. Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Of your research for understanding uh, global you know, in, inequality on, between on societies. On blogging heads or in your office, but either way, Glenn, it's, it's nice to have a, a good period of time to chat with you. Well, I'm sure it's going to happen. Thanks again for, for doing this, Lewis, okay? You too. Bye. Okay. Take care.